magic word Here in the secret kindergarten The world's best show for kids is starting The secret kindergarten radio show Use your ears and your imagination We're going to play, we're having fun Hello, I love you, and welcome back to the Secret Kindergarten Radio Show, and I'm your host, Gino, as in G. No! And I used to be an early childhood teacher, a kindergarten teacher. <laughs> and boy, you young kids made me end up going home and drinking a lot of growing up juice. A lot of growing up juice. <laughs> but all is well. And today we're going to be exploring stories from the old days. And we're going to be exploring Little Red Riding Hood. Let's get straight into it. We are going to play more than one Little, Little Red Riding Hood story. And we're going to see what's the difference. Because did you know that people change stories sometimes? Sometimes people don't want anyone listening to a story ever again. Sometimes people change their own stories as well. But anyway, let's listen to Little Red Riding Hood. Little Red Riding Hood by Charles Perrault Once upon a time, there lived in a certain village a little country girl, the prettiest creature ever seen. Her mother was very fond of her, and her grandmother doted on her still more. This good woman had made for her a Little Red Riding Hood, which became the girl so well that everybody called her Little Red Riding Hood. One day, her mother, having made some custard, said to her, Go, my dear, and see how thy grandmama does, for I hear she has been very ill. Carry her a custard in this little pot of butter. Little Red Riding Hood set out immediately to go to her grandmother, who lived in another village. As she was going through the wood, she met with Gaffer Wolf, who had a very great mind to eat her up, but he durst not because of some faggot makers hard by in the forest. He asked her whither she was going. The poor child, who did not know that it was dangerous to stop and listen to a wolf, said to him, I am going to see my grandmama and carry her a custard and a little pot of butter from my mama. Does she live far off? said the wolf. Oh, yes, answered Little Red Riding Hood. It is beyond the mill you see there, at the first house in the village. Well, said the wolf, I'll go and see her too. I'll go this way, and you go that, and we shall see who will be there soonest. The wolf began to run as fast as he could, taking the nearest way, and the little girl went by the longest, diverting herself and gathering nuts, running after butterflies, and making nosegays of such little flowers as she met with. The wolf was not long before he got to the old woman's house. He knocked at the door. Tap, tap. Who's there? Your grandchild, Little Red Riding Hood, replied the wolf, imitating her voice, who has brought you a custard and a little pot of butter sent you by Mama. The good grandmother, who was in bed because she was ill, cried out, Pull the bobbin and the latch will go up. The wolf pulled the bobbin and the door opened and he fell upon the good woman and ate her up in a moment, for it was above three days that he had not touched a bit. He then shut the door and went into the grandmother's bed, expecting Little Red Riding Hood, who came some time afterward and knocked at the door. Tap, tap. Who's there? Little Red Riding Hood, hearing the big voice of the wolf, was at first afraid, but believing her grandmother had got a cold and was hoarse, answered, "'Tis your grandchild, Little Red Riding Hood, who has brought you a custard and a little pot of butter Mama sends you." The wolf cried out to her, softening his voice as much as he could, "'Pull the bobbin, and the latch will go up.' Little Red Riding Hood pulled the bobbin, and the door opened. The wolf, seeing her come in, said to her, hiding himself under the bedclothes, "'Put the custard and the little pot of butter upon the stool, and come and lie down with me.' Little Red Riding Hood undressed herself and went into bed, where, being greatly amazed to see how her grandmother looked in her nightclothes, 
she said to her, Grandmama, what great arms you've got. That is the better to hug thee, my dear. Grandmama, what great legs you've got. The better to run, my child. Grandmama, what great ears you've got. The better to hear, my child. Grandmama, what great eyes you've got. The better to see, my child. Grandmama, what great teeth you've got. To eat thee up. And saying these words, the wicked wolf fell upon Little Red Riding Hood and ate her all up. End of section 74. Ah! The wolf ate them up! Oh my gosh. How does that make you feel? What do you feel about that? What do you think about that? I have a question that I don't think I know the answer to yet, is why do these old stories for children, the children get eaten up or they get killed? I'm starting to think that that's not the important part of the story. I know that you young children are very brave. And also, I know when you pretend play, that you <laughs> don't mind pretending to be dead. <laughs> so maybe it's not a big deal for you. I don't know. But let's listen to... So that was Little Red Riding Hood by Charles Perrault, which came before... Little Red Riding Hood by the one we all really know is the Brothers Grimm. Let's listen to it. Little Red Riding Hood From Grimm's Fairy Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Once upon a time there was a dear little girl who was loved by everyone who looked at her, but most of all by her grandmother, and there was nothing that she would not have given to the child. Once she gave her a little cap of red velvet, which suited her so well that she would never wear anything else. So she was always called Little Red Riding Hood. One day her mother said to her, Come, Little Red Riding Hood, here is a piece of cake and a bottle of wine. Take them to your grandmother. She is ill and weak, and they will do her good. Set out before it gets hot, and when you are going, walk nicely and quietly, and do not run off the path, or you may fall and break the bottle, and then your grandmother will get nothing. And when you go into her room, don't forget to say, Good morning, and don't peep into every corner before you do it. I will take great care, said Little Red Riding Hood to her mother, and gave her hand on it. The grandmother lived out in the wood, half a league from the village, and just as Little Red Riding Hood entered the wood, a wolf met her. Little Red Riding Hood did not know what a wicked creature he was, and was not at all afraid of him. "'Good day, Little Red Riding Hood,' said he. "'Thank you kindly, wolf. Whither away so early, Little Red Riding Hood? To my grandmother's. What have you got in your apron? A cake and wine. Yesterday was baking day. So poor sick grandmother is to have something good to make her stronger. Where does your grandmother live, little Red Riding Hood? A good quarter of a league farther on in the wood. Her house stands under three large oak trees. The nut trees are just below. You surely must know it, replied little Red Riding Hood. The wolf thought to himself, What a tender young creature! What a nice plump mouthful! <laughs> she will be better to eat than the old woman. I must act craftily, so as to catch both. So he walked for a short time by the side of Little Red Riding Hood, and then he said, See, Little Red Riding Hood, how pretty the flowers are about here. Why do you not look around? I believe, too, that you do not hear how sweetly the little birds are singing. You walk gravely along as if you were going to school, while everything else out here in the world is merry. 
Little Red Riding Hood raised her eyes, and when she saw the sunbeams dancing here and there through the trees, and pretty flowers growing everywhere, she thought, oh, "'Suppose I take Grandmother a fresh nosegay. That would please her, too. It is so early in the day that I shall still get there in good time.' and so she ran from the path into the wood to look for flowers and whenever she had picked one she fancied that she saw a still prettier one farther on and ran after it and so got deeper and deeper into the wood meanwhile the wolf ran straight to the grandmother's house and knocked at the door who is there little red riding hood replied the wolf she is bringing cake and wine open the door uh, lift the latch cried out the grandmother i am too weak and cannot get up the wolf lifted the latch the door sprang open and without saying a word he went straight to the grandmother's bed and devoured her then he put on her clothes dressed himself in her cap laid himself in bed and drew the curtains little red riding hood however had been running about picking flowers and when she had gathered so many that she could carry no more, she remembered her grandmother, and set out on the way to her. She was surprised to find the cottage door standing open, and when she went into the room she had a, such a strange feeling that she said to herself, "'Oh, dear, how uneasy I feel to-day! And at other times I like being with grandmother so much!' She called out, "'Good morning!' but received no answer. So she went to the bed and drew back the curtains. There lay her grandmother with her cap pulled far over her face, and looking very strange. "'Oh, grandmother,' she said, "'what big ears you have!' "'The better to hear you with, my child,' was the reply. "'But, grandmother, what big eyes you have!' she said. "'The better to see you with, my dear. "'But, grandmother, what large hands you have! "'The better to hug you with. "'Oh, but, grandmother, what a terrible big mouth you have! "'The better to eat you with!' "'And scarcely had the wolf said this "'than with one bound he was out of bed "'and swallowed up Little Red Riding Hood.' When the wolf had appeased his appetite, he lay down again in the bed, fell asleep, and began to snore very loud. The huntsman was just passing the house, and thought to himself, "'How the old woman is snoring! I must just see if she wants anything.' So he went into the room, and when he came to the bed, he saw that the wolf was lying in it. "'Do I find you here, you old sinner?' said he, I have long sought you. Then, just as he was going to fire at him, it occurred to him that the wolf might have devoured the grandmother, and that she might still be saved. So he did not fire, but took a pair of scissors, and began to cut open the stomach of the sleeping wolf. When he had made two snips, he saw the little red riding hood shining, and then he made two snips more, and the little girl sprang out, crying, Ah, how frightened I have been! How dark it was inside the wolf's! And after that the aged grandmother came out alive also, but scarcely able to breathe. Little Red Riding Hood, however, quickly fetched great stones with which to fill the wolf's belly, and when he awoke he wanted to run away, but the stones were so heavy that he collapsed at once and fell dead. Then all three were delighted. The huntsman drew off the wolf's skin and went home with it. The grandmother ate the cake and drank the wine which Little Red Riding Hood had brought, and revived. But Little Red Riding Hood thought to herself, "'As long as I live, I will never by myself leave the path to run into the wood when my mother has forbidden me to do so.' It was also related that once, when Little Red Riding Hood was again taking cakes to the old grandmother, Another wolf spoke to her, and tried to entice her from the path. Little Red Riding Hood, however, was on her guard, and went straight forward on her way, and told her grandmother that she had met the wolf, 
and that he had said good morning to her, but with such a wicked look in his eyes, that if they had not been on the public road she was certain he would have eaten her up. "'Well,' said the grandmother, "'we will shut the door, that he may not come in.' Soon afterwards the wolf knocked, and cried, "'Open the door, grandmother. I am Little Red Riding Hood, and am bringing you some cakes.' But they did not speak, or open the door. So the greybeard stole twice or thrice around the house, and at last jumped on the roof, intending to wait until Little Riding Hood went home in the evening, and then to steal after her and devour her in the darkness. But the grandmother saw what was in his thoughts. In front of the house was a great stone trough. So she said to the child, "'Take the pail, Little Red Riding Hood. I made some sausages yesterday, so carry the water in which I boiled them to the trough.' Little Red Riding Hood carried until the great trough was quite full. Then the smell of the sausages reached the wolf, and he sniffed and peeped down, and at last stretched out his neck so far that he could no longer keep his footing and began to slip, and slipped down from the roof straight into the great trough and was drowned. But Little Red Riding Hood went joyously home, and no one ever did anything to harm her again. End of Little Red Riding Hood What a naughty wolf! In that story they caught the wolf in the end. They got the wolf. He was kind of like the big bad wolf in that story. How does that story make you feel? How does that story sound compared to the first version of Little Red Riding Hood that I played? Which one do you prefer? I'm wondering if Little Red Riding Hood is brave and courageous in both of the stories. I think she is. Now let's go to another story. There's another story here from the Bible. <laughs> My mom will be very happy I'm playing a story from the Bible. <laughs> because I think there's something similar in this story to Little Red Riding Hood. This is thereabouts the book of Jonah. Let's listen to this. The Book of Jonah from the Basic Bible Old Testament Translated by S. H. Hook Chapter 1 And the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Up, go to Nineveh, that great town, and let your voice come to it, for their evil doing has come up before me. And Jonah got up to go in flight to Tarshish, away from the Lord. And he went down to Joppa, and saw there a ship going to Tarshish. So he gave them the price of the journey, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the Lord. And the Lord sent out a great wind on to the sea, and there was a violent storm in the sea, so that the ship seemed in danger of being broken. Then the sailors were full of fear, every man crying to his God. And the goods in the ship were dropped out into the sea to make the weight less. But Jonah had gone down into the inmost part of the ship, where he was stretched out in a deep sleep. And the ship's captain came to him and said to him, What are you doing sleeping? Up! Say a prayer to your God, if by chance God will give a thought to us, so that we may not come to destruction. And they said to one another, Come, let us put this to the decision of chance, and see on whose account this evil has come on us. So they did so, and Jonah was seen to be the man. Then they said to him, Now make clear to us what is your work, and where you come from, what is your country, and who are your people. And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, a worshipper of the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And the men were in great fear, and they said to him, What is this you have done? For the men had knowledge of his flight from the Lord, because he had not kept it from them. And they said to him, what are we to do to you so that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was getting rougher and rougher. And he said to them, 
Take me up and put me into the sea, and the sea will become calm for you, for I am certain that because of me this great storm has come on you. And the men were working hard to get back to the land, but they were not able to do so, for the sea got rougher and rougher against them. So crying to the Lord, they said, Give ear to our prayer, O Lord, give ear, and do not let destruction overtake us because of this man's life. Do not put on us the sin of taking life without cause, for you, O Lord, have done what seemed good to you. So they took Jonah up and put him into the sea, and the sea was no longer angry. Then great was the men's fear of the Lord, and they made an offering to the Lord and took oaths to him. And the Lord made ready a great fish to take Jonah into its mouth. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Chapter 2 Then Jonah made prayer to the Lord his God from the inside of the fish, and said, In my trouble I was crying to the Lord, and he gave me an answer. Out of the deepest underworld I sent up a cry, and you gave ear to my voice. For you have put me down into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the river was round about me. All your waves and your rolling waters went over me. And I said, I have been sent away from before your eyes. How may I ever again see your holy temple? The waters were circling round me, even to the neck. The deep was about me. The sea grass was twisted round my head. I went down to the bases of the mountains. As for the earth, her walls were about me forever. But you have taken up my life from the underworld, O Lord my God. When my soul in me was overcome, I kept the memory of the Lord, and my prayer came into you, into your holy temple. The worshippers of false gods have given up their only hope, but I will make an offering to you with the voice of praise. I will give effect to my oaths. Salvation is the Lord's. And at the Lord's order, the fish sent Jonah out of its mouth onto the dry land. Chapter 3 and the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Up, go to Nineveh, that great town, and give it the word which I have given you. So Jonah got up and went to Nineveh as the Lord had said. Now Nineveh was a very great town, three days' journey from end to end. And Jonah first of all went a day's journey into the town, and crying out, said, In forty days destruction will overtake Nineveh! And the people of Nineveh had belief in God. And a time was fixed for going without food, and they put on hair cloth from the greatest to the least. And the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he got up from his seat of authority, and took off his robe, and covering himself with hair cloth, took his seat in the dust. And he had it given out in Nineveh. By the order of the king and his great men, no man or beast, herd or flock, is to have a taste of anything. Let them have no food or water, and let man and beast be covered with hair cloth, and let them make strong prayers to God, and let every one be turned from his evil way and the violent acts of their hands. Who may say that God will not be turned, changing his purpose and turning away from his burning wrath, so that destruction may not overtake us? And God saw what they did, how they were turned from their evil way and God's purpose was changed as to the evil which he said he would do to them, and he did it not. Chapter 4 But this seemed very wrong to Jonah, and he was angry, and he made prayer to the Lord, and said, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still in my country? This is why I took care to go in flight to Tarshish, for I was certain that you were a loving God, full of pity, slow to be angry and great in mercy, and ready to be turned from your purpose of evil. So now, O Lord, give ear to my prayer, and take my life from me, for death is better for me than life. And the Lord said, Have you any right to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the town, and took his seat on the east side of the town, and made himself a roof of branches, and took his seat under its shade, till he saw what would become of the town. And the Lord God made a vine come up over Jonah to give him shade over his head, and Jonah was very glad because of the vine. But early on the morning after, God made ready a worm for the destruction of the vine, and it became dry and dead. Then when the sun came up, God sent a burning east wind, 
And so great was the heat of the sun on his head that Jonah was overcome, and requesting death for himself, said, Death is better for me than life! And the Lord said to Jonah, Have you any right to be angry about the vine? And he said, I have a right to be truly angry! And the Lord said, You had pity on the vine, for which you did no work, and for the growth of which you were not responsible, which came up in a night, and came to an end in a night. And am I not to have mercy on Nineveh, that great town, in which there are more than a hundred and twenty thousand persons without the power of judging between right and left, as well as much cattle? The End of the Book of Jonah Wow. Jonah. Do you think he was a happy person? <laughs> hey, at least uh, Red Riding Hood didn't complain so much, right? <laughs> oh, we're coming up to an ad break here on Revolution Radio. Thanks for tuning in. Let's stick around. Uh, we are going to play some more stories after this. Welcome back to the Secret Kindergarten Radio Show. Jonah and the Whale Jonah got eaten up by the whale and he was in the whale's tummy and he got out. Little Red Riding Hood got eaten up by the wolf and she was in the wolf's tummy and got out. Jonah said a prayer. Do you think Little Red Riding Hood said a prayer? Why are these people ending up in animals' tummies and getting out? Let's listen to another story. Let's listen to... The Wolf and the Seven Little Kids The Wolf and the Seven Little Kids From Grimm's Fairy Tales By Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Edgar Taylor and Marion Edwards. There was once upon a time an old goat who had seven little kids, and loved them with all the love of a mother for her children. One day she wanted to go into the forest and fetch some food, so she called all seven to her and said, Dear children, I have to go into the forest. Be on your guard against the wolf. If he comes in, he will devour you all, skin, hair, and everything. The wretch often disguises himself, but you will know him at once by his rough voice and his black feet. The kids said, Dear mother, we will take good care of ourselves. You may go away without any anxiety. Then the old one bleated and went on her way with an easy mind. It was not long before some one knocked at the house door and called, Open the door, dear children. Your mother is here, and has brought something back with her for each of you. But the little kids knew that it was the wolf by the rough voice. We will not open the door, cried they. You are not our mother. She has a soft, pleasant voice, but your voice is rough. You are the wolf. Then the wolf went away to a shopkeeper, and bought himself a great lump of chalk, ate this, and made his voice soft with it. Then he came back, knocked at the door of the house, and called, "'Open the door, dear children, and your mother is here, and has brought something back with her for each of you.' But the wolf had laid his black paws against the window, and the children saw them, and cried, "'We will not open the door. Our mother has not black feet like you. You are the wolf.' Then the wolf ran to a baker, and said, I have hurt my feet. Rub some dough over them for me. And when the baker had rubbed his feet over, he ran to the miller and said, Strew some white meal over my feet for me. The miller thought to himself, The wolf wants to deceive someone, and refused. But the wolf said, If you will not do it, I will devour you. Then the miller was afraid, and made his paws white for him. Truly, this is the way of mankind. 
So now the wretch went for the third time to the house door, knocked at it, and said, "'Open the door for me, children. Your dear little mother has come home, and has brought every one of you something back from the forest with her.' The little kids cried, First, show us your paws, that we may know if you are our dear little mother. Then he put his paws in through the window, and when the kids saw that they were white, they believed that all he said was true, and opened the door. But who should come in but the wolf? They were terrified and wanted to hide themselves. One sprang under the table, the second into the bed, the third into the stove, the fourth into the kitchen, the fifth into the cupboard, the sixth under the washing-bowl, and the seventh into the clock-case. But the wolf found them all, and used no great ceremony. One after the other he swallowed them down his throat. The youngest, who was in the clock-case, was the only one he did not find. When the wolf had satisfied his appetite, he took himself off, laid himself down under a tree in the green meadow outside, and began to sleep. Soon afterwards the old goat came home again from the forest. Ah, what a sight she saw there! The house door stood wide open, the table, chairs, and benches were thrown down, the washing-bowl lay broken to pieces, and the quilts and pillows were pulled off the bed. She sought her children, but they were nowhere to be found. She called them one after another by name, but no one answered. At last, when she came to the youngest, a soft voice cried, "'Dear mother, I am in the clock-case.' She took the kid out, and it told her that the wolf had come and eaten all the others. Then you may imagine how she wept over her poor children. At length, in her grief, she went out, and the youngest kid ran with her. When they came to the meadow, there lay the wolf by the tree, and snored so loud that the branches shook. She looked at him on every side, and saw that something was moving and struggling in his gorged belly. "'Ah, heavens!' she said. "'Is it possible that my poor children, whom he has swallowed down for his supper, can still be alive?' Then the kid had to run home and fetch scissors, and a needle and thread, and the goat cut open the monster's stomach.' and hardly had she made one cut than one little kid thrust its head out, and when she had cut farther, all six sprang out, one after another, and were all still alive, and had suffered no injury whatever, for in his greediness the monster had swallowed them down whole. What rejoicing there was! They embraced their dear mother, and jumped like a tailor at his wedding. The mother, however, said, now go and look for some big stones, and we will fill the wicked beast's stomach with them while he is still asleep. Then the seven kids dragged the stones thither with all speed, and put as many of them into his stomach as they could get in, and the mother sewed him up again in the greatest haste, so that he was not aware of anything, and never once stirred. When the wolf at length had had his fill of sleep, he got on his legs, and as the stones in his stomach made him very thirsty, he wanted to go to a well to drink. But when he began to walk and to move about, the stones in his stomach knocked against each other and rattled. Then cried he, What rumbles and tumbles against my poor bones? I thought twas six kids, but it feels like big stones. And when he got to the well and stooped over the water to drink, the heavy stones made him fall in and he drowned miserably. When the seven kids saw that, they were running for the spot, and cried aloud, The wolf is dead! The wolf is dead! and danced for joy round about the well with their mother. End of The Wolf and the Seven Little Kids End of The Wolf, all right. So, do you, do you notice... What's the same about that story compared to the other stories we've listened to? Well, I noticed that the goats, the kid goats, they ended up in, the, in a wolf's tummy too. And they got cut out. And they lived to see another day. 
Do you think it's the same wolf? And then in the book of Jonah, it was a whale. It wasn't a wolf. And what about how the wolf died? The wolf fell into some water again in a different story. Let's listen to some music. Every birdie has a song to sing. Every birdie has a song to sing. You hear it singing all day long for a birdie has to sing a song. Every birdie has a song to sing. And every baby has a song to sing. Every baby has a song to sing. And though it won't have any words, it's the sweetest song you've ever heard. Every baby has a song to sing. Every mother has a song to sing. Every mother has a song to sing. A song for singing when it's light and a lullaby to sing at night. Every mother has a song to sing. Every daddy has a song to sing. Every daddy has a song to sing. You hear him holler out a song or humming quietly along. Every daddy has a song to sing. Every grandma has a song to sing. Every grandma has a song to sing. And when she sings her song to you, then it becomes your song too. Every grandma has a song to sing. Every grandpa has a song to sing. Every grandpa has a song to sing. A song of happiness or strife, a song he's carried all his life. Every grandpa has a song to sing. Everybody has a song to sing. Everybody has a song to sing. And when we're singing the same song, you know we just can't do it wrong. Everybody has a song to sing. When we're singing the same song, you know we just can't do it wrong. Everybody has a song to sing. Everybody has a song to sing.
donkey run run my little donkey run run my little donkey run we have some more stories we are exploring this idea of stories that have people getting eaten up and then eaten up whole and then getting pulled out of the tummy of the the, <laughs> the beast that ate them up <laughs> I wonder if this one has a similar idea in it this one is another Brothers Grimm story it's the Frog Prince let's listen to see what happens in this one The Frog Prince from Grimm's Fairy Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Edgar Taylor and Marion Edwards. One fine evening a young princess put on her bonnets and clogs, and went out to take a walk by herself in a wood, and when she came to a cool spring of water that rose in the midst of it, she sat herself down to rest a while. Now she had a golden ball in her hand, which was her favorite plaything and she was always tossing it up into the air and catching it again as it fell. After a time she threw it up so high that she missed catching it as it fell, and the ball bounded away and rolled along upon the ground, till at last it fell down into the spring. The princess looked into the spring after her ball, but it was very deep, so deep that she could not see the bottom of it. Then she began to bewail her loss, and said, Alas, if I could only get my ball again, I would give all my fine clothes and jewels, and everything that I have in the world. Whilst she was speaking, a frog put its head out of the water, and said, Princess, why do you weep so bitterly? Alas, she said, what can you do for me, you nasty frog? My golden ball has fallen into the spring. The frog said, I want not your pearls and jewels and fine clothes, but if you will love me, and let me live with you, and eat from off your golden plate, and sleep upon your bed, I will bring you your ball again. What nonsense this silly frog is talking, thought the princess. He can never even get out of the spring to visit me though he may be able to get my ball for me, and therefore I will tell him he shall have what he asks. So she said to the frog, Well, if you will bring me my ball, I will do all you ask. Then the frog put his head down and dived deep under the water, and after a little while he came up again with the ball in his mouth, and threw it on the edge of the spring. As soon as the young princess saw her ball, she ran to pick it up, and she was so overjoyed to have it in her hand again that she never thought of the frog, but ran home with it as fast as she could. The frog called after her, Stay, princess, and take me with you, as you said. But she did not stop to hear a word. The next day, just as the princess had sat down to dinner, she heard a strange noise, tap, tap, plash, plash, as if something was coming up the marble staircase, and soon afterwards there was a great knock at the door, and a little voice cried out and said, Open the door, my princess dear, open the door to thy true love here, and mind the words that thou and I said by the fountain cool in the greenwood shade. Then the princess ran to the door and opened it, and there she saw the frog, whom she had quite forgotten. At this sight she was sadly frightened, and shutting the door as fast as she could, came back to her seat. The king, her father, seeing that something had frightened her, asked her what was the matter. "'There is a nasty frog,' said she, at the door that lifted my ball for me out of the spring this morning. I told him that he should live with me here, thinking that he could never get out of the spring. But there he is at the door, and he wants to come in. 
While she was speaking, the frog knocked again at the door, and said, "'Open the door, my princess dear, open the door to thy true love here, and mind the words that thou and I said by the fountain cool in the greenwood shade.' Then the king said to the young princess, "'As you have given your word, you must keep it. So go and let him in.' She did so and the frog hopped into the room, and then straight on, tap, tap, plash, plash, from the bottom of the room to the top, till he came up close to the table where the princess sat. "'Pray, lift me upon the chair,' said he to the princess, "'and let me sit next to you.' As soon as she had done this, the frog said, "'Put your plate nearer to me, that I may eat out of it.' This she did, and when he had eaten as much as he could, he said, "'Now I am tired. Carry me upstairs and put me into your bed.' And the princess, though very unwilling, took him up in her hand and put him upon the pillow of her own bed, where he slept all night long. As soon as it was light, he jumped up, hopped downstairs, and went out of the house. "'Now, then,' thought the princess, "'at last he is gone, and I shall be troubled with him no more.' But she was mistaken, for when night came again she heard the same tapping at the door, and the frog came once more and said, "'Open the door, my princess dear, open the door to thy true love here.' and mind the words that thou and I said by the fountain cool in the greenwood shade. And when the princess opened the door, the frog came in, and slept upon her pillow as before, till the morning broke. And the third night he did the same. But when the princess awoke on the following morning, she was astonished to see, instead of the frog, a handsome prince, gazing on her with the most beautiful eyes she had ever seen, and standing at the head of her bed. He told her that he had been enchanted by a spiteful fairy, who had changed him into a frog, and that he had been fated so to abide till some princess should take him out of the spring, and let him eat from her plate, and sleep upon her bed for three nights. You, said the prince, have broken his cruel charm, and now I have nothing to wish for but that you should go with me into my father's kingdom, where I will marry you and love you as long as you live. The young princess, you may be sure, was not long in saying yes to all this, and as they spoke, a gay coach drove up, with eight beautiful horses decked with plumes of feathers and a golden harness and behind the coach rode the princess's servant, faithful Heinrich, who had bewailed the misfortunes of his dear master during his enchantment so long and so bitterly that his heart had well-nigh burst. They then took leave of the king, and got into the coach with eight horses, and all set out, full of joy and merriment, for the princess's kingdom, which they reached safely and there they lived happily a great many years. End of the Frog Prince Wow. And I think that was a story no one got eaten up. Hang on a minute. What about the prince? Do you think he was in the frog's tummy? Do you think he got eaten up? You know what I saw similar about the other stories is unwanted animals knocking on people's houses, houses, doors, and coming in and sleeping in their bed. What's that all about? Let's listen to a quick song. The cycle of water goes around and around As the water rises up from the earth to the clouds the clouds rain down on the ground below, and the cycle of water is an endless flow. The 
cycle of water goes around and around. As the water rises up, goes around and around. As the fire rains up, goes around and around. And the fire rains up, goes around and around. And the fire rains down on the ground to the cloud. And the fire rains down on the ground below. And the cycle of water is an endless flow. And we got time for a quick song. Before we go to chapter 7 of The Adventures of Maya the Bee, let's listen to Trees by Nancy Stewart from nancymusic.com. Every tree has roots and trunk and leaves and flowers too. The flowers and leaves and trunk and roots all have a job to do. It all begins with the flowers, for they keep the seeds that grow. Carried by the wind, the birds and squirrels down to the ground below. Every tree has roots, a trunk, and leaves and flowers too. The flowers and leaves and trunk and roots all have a job to do. Leaves are a food factory, using sun and water too. They call it photosynthesis, but the trees just call it food. Every tree has roots, a trunk, and leaves. Let's listen to Chapter 7 of The Adventures of Maya the Bee by Walter Moore Bond Sells. Chapter 7 In the Toils. Chapter 7 of The Adventures of Maya the Bee In the Toils. After her meeting with Puck the Fly, Maya was not in a particularly happy frame of mind. She could not bring herself to believe that he was right in everything he had said about human beings or right in his relations to them. She had formed an entirely different conception, a much finer, lovelier picture, and she fought against letting her mind harbor low or ridiculous ideas of mankind. Yet she was still afraid to enter a human dwelling. How was she to know whether or not the owner would like it? And she wouldn't for all the world make herself a burden to anyone. Her thoughts went back once more to the things Cassandra had told her. "'They are good and wise,' Cassandra had said. They are strong and powerful, but they never abuse their power. On the contrary, wherever they go, they bring order and prosperity. We bees, knowing they are friendly to us, put ourselves under their protection and share our honey with them. They leave us enough for the winter, they provide us with shelter against the cold, and guard us against the hosts of our enemies among the animals. There are few creatures in the world who have entered into such a relation of friendship and voluntary service with human beings. Among the insects, you will often hear voices raised to speak evil of man. Don't listen to them. If a foolish tribe of bees ever returns to the wild and tries to do without human beings, it soon perishes. There are too many beasts that hanker for our honey— and often a whole bee city, all its buildings, all its inhabitants, has been ruthlessly destroyed, merely because a senseless animal wanted to satisfy its greed for honey. 
That is what Cassandra had told Maya about human beings, and until Maya had convinced herself of the contrary, she wanted to keep this belief in them. It was now afternoon. The sun was dropping behind the fruit trees in a large vegetable garden through which Maya was flying. The trees were long past flowering, but the little bee still remembered them in the shining glory of countless blossoms, whiter than light, lovely, pure, and exquisite against the blue of the heavens. The delicious perfume, the gleam and the shimmer, oh, she'd never forget the rapture of it as long as she lived. As she flew, she thought of how all that beauty would come again, and her heart expanded with delight in the glory of the great world in which she was permitted to live. At the end of the garden shone the starry tufts of the jasmine, delicate yellow faces set in a wreath of pure white, sweet perfume wafted to Maya on the soft wings of the breeze. Weren't there still some trees in bloom? Wasn't it the season for lindens? Maya thought delightedly of the big, serious lindens, whose tops held the red glow of the setting sun to the very last. She flew in among the stems of the blackberry vines, which were putting forth green berries and yielding blossoms at the same time. As she mounted again to reach the jasmine, something strange to the touch suddenly laid itself across her forehead and shoulders, and just as quickly covered her wings— it was the queerest sensation, as if her wings were crippled, and she were suddenly restrained in her flight, and were falling, helplessly falling. A secret, wicked force seemed to be holding her feelers, her legs, her wings, in invisible captivity. But she did not fall. Though she could no longer move her wings, she still hung in the air rocking, caught by a marvelously yielding softness and delicacy, "'raised a little, lowered a little, tossed here, tossed there, "'like a loose leaf in a faint breeze. "'Maya was troubled, but not as yet actually terrified. "'Why should she be? "'There was no pain nor real discomfort of any sort. "'Simply that it was so peculiar, so very peculiar, "'and something bad seemed to be lurking in the background. "'She must get on.' If she tried very hard, she could, assuredly. But now she saw a thread across her breast, an elastic silvery thread, finer than the finest silk. She clutched at it quickly, in a cold wave of terror. It clung to her hand. It wouldn't shake off. And there ran another silver thread over her shoulders. It drew itself across her wings and tied them together. Her wings were powerless. And there, and there, everywhere in the air and above her body, those bright, glittering, gluey threads. Maya screamed with horror. Now she knew. Oh, oh, now she knew. She was in a spider's web. Her terrified shrieks rang out in the silent dome of the summer day where the sunshine touched the green of the leaves into gold, and insects flitted to and fro, and birds swooped gaily from tree to tree. Nearby, the jasmine sent its perfume into the air, the jasmine she had wanted to reach. Now all was over. A small bluish butterfly, with brown dots gleaming like copper on its wings, came flying very close. "'Oh, you poor soul!' it cried, hearing Maya's screams and seeing her desperate plight. "'May your death be an easy one, lovely child. I cannot help you. Some day, perhaps this very night, I shall meet with the same fate. But meanwhile, life is still lovely for me. Good-bye. Don't forget the sunshine in the deep sleep of death.' And the blue butterfly rocked away, drugged by the sunshine and the flowers in its joy of living. The tears streamed from Maya's eyes. She lost her last shred of self-control. She tossed her captive body to and fro, and buzzed as loud as she could, and screamed for help, from whom she did not know. But the more she tossed, the tighter she enmeshed herself in the web. Now, in her great agony, Cassandra's warnings went through her head. "'Beware of the spider and its web. 
If we bees fall into the spider's power, we suffer the most gruesome death. The spider is heartless and tricky, and once it has a person in its toils, it never lets go. In a great flare of mortal terror, Maya made one huge, desperate effort. Somewhere one of the long, heavier suspension threads snapped. Maya felt it break, yet at the same time she sensed the awful doom of the cobweb. This was that the more one struggled in it, the more effectively and dangerously it worked. She gave up in complete exhaustion. At that moment she saw the spider herself, very near, under a blackberry leaf. At sight of the great monster, silent and serious, crouching there as if ready to pounce, Maya's horror was indescribable. The wicked, shining eyes were fastened on the little bee in sinister, cold-blooded patience. Maya gave one loud shriek. This was the worst agony of all. Death itself could look no worse than that gray, hairy monster with her mean fangs and the raised legs supporting her fat body like a scaffolding. She would come rushing upon her, and then all would be over. Now a dreadful fury of anger came upon Maya, such as she had never felt before. Forgetting her great agony, intent only upon one thing, selling her life as dearly as possible, she uttered her clear alarming battle cry, which all beasts knew and dreaded. "'You will pay for your cunning with death!' she shouted at the spider. "'Just come and try to kill me. You'll find out what a bee can do!' The spider did not budge. She really was uncanny, and must have terrified bigger creatures than little Maya. Strong in her anger, Maya now made another violent, desperate effort. Snap! One of the long suspension threads above her broke. The web was probably meant for flies and gnats, not for such large insects as bees. But Maya got herself only more entangled. In one gliding motion, the spider drew quite close to Maya. She swung by her nimble legs upon a single thread, with her body hanging straight downward. "'What right have you to break my net?' she rasped at Maya. "'What are you doing here? Isn't the world big enough for you? Why do you disturb a peaceful recluse?' That was not what Maya had expected to hear. Most certainly not. "'I didn't mean to,' she cried, quivering with glad hope. Ugly as the spider was, still she did not seem to intend any harm. "'I didn't see your web, and I got tangled in it. I'm so sorry. Please pardon me.' The spider drew nearer. "'You're a funny little body,' she said letting go of the thread first with one leg, then with the other. The delicate thread shook. How wonderful that it could support the great creature! "'Oh, do help me out of this,' begged Maya. "'I should be so grateful!' "'That's what I came here for,' said the spider, and smiled strangely. For all her smiling she looked mean and deceitful, your tossing and tugging spoils the whole web. Keep quiet one second, and I will set you free. Oh, thanks! Ever so many thanks! cried Maya. The spider was now right beside her. She examined the web carefully to see how securely Maya was entangled. How about your sting? she asked. Ugh, how mean and horrid she looked! Maya fairly shivered with disgust at the thought that she was going to touch her, but replied as pleasantly as she could, "'Don't trouble about my sting. I will draw it in, and nobody can hurt himself on it then.' "'I should hope not,' said the spider. "'Now then, look out. Keep quiet. Too bad for my web.' Maya remained still. Suddenly she felt herself being whirled round and round on the same spot, till she got dizzy and sick and had to close her eyes. But what was that? She opened her eyes quickly, 
Horrors! She was completely enmeshed in a fresh, sticky thread, which the spider must have had with her. "'My God!' cried little Maya softly in a quivering voice. That was all she said. Now she saw how tricky the spider had been. Now she was really caught beyond release. Now there was absolutely no chance of escape. She could no longer move any part of her body. The end was near. Her fury of anger was gone. There was only a great sadness in her heart. I didn't know there was such meanness and wickedness in the world, she thought. The deep night of death is upon me. Goodbye, dear bright sun. Goodbye, my dear friend bees. Why did I leave you? A happy life to you. I must die. The spider sat wary a little to one side. She was still afraid of Maya's sting. Well, she jeered, how are you feeling, little girl? Maya was too proud to answer the false creature. She merely said, after a while, when she felt she couldn't bear any more, Please, kill me right away. Really? said the spider, tying a few torn threads together. Really, do you take me to be as big a dunce as yourself? You're going to die anyhow, if you're kept hanging long enough, and that's the time for me to suck the blood out of you, when you can't sting. Too bad, though, that you can't see how dreadfully you've damaged my lovely web. Then you'd realize that you deserve to die. She dropped down to the ground, laid the end of the newly spun thread about a stone, and pulled it in tight. Then she ran up again, caught hold of the thread by which little enmeshed Maya hung, and dragged her captive along. "'You're going into the shade, my dear,' she said, "'so that you shall not dry up out here in the sunshine. "'Besides, hanging here, you're like a scarecrow. "'You'll frighten away other nice little mortals "'who don't watch where they're going. "'And sometimes the sparrows come and rob my web. "'To let you know with whom you're dealing, "'my name is Thecla, of the family of cross spiders. You needn't tell me your name. It makes no difference. You're a fat bit, and you'll taste just as tender and juicy by any name. So little Maya hung in the shade of the blackberry vine, close to the ground, completely at the mercy of the cruel spider, who intended her to die by slow starvation. Hanging with her little head downward, a fearful position to be in, she soon felt she would not last many more minutes. She whimpered softly, and her cries for help grew feebler and feebler. Who was there to hear? Her folk at home knew nothing of this catastrophe, so they couldn't come hurrying to her rescue. Suddenly, down in the grass, she heard someone growling. "'Make way! I'm coming!' Maya's agonized heart began to beat stormily. She recognized the voice of Bobby the dung beetle. Bobby! she called as loud as she could. Bobby! Dear Bobby! Make way! I'm coming! But I'm not in your way, Bobby! cried Maya. Oh dear! I'm hanging over your head. The spider has caught me. Who are you? asked Bobby. So many people know me. You know they do, don't you? I'm a Maya, Maya the bee. Oh, please, please help me. Maya, Maya. Ah, now I remember. You made my acquaintance several weeks ago. The deuce. You are in a bad way, if I must say so myself. You certainly do need my help. As I happen to have a few moments' time, I won't refuse. Oh, Bobby, can you tear these threads? Tear those threads? Do you mean to insult me? Bobby slapped the muscles of his arm. Look, little girl, hard as steel. No match for that in strength. 
I can do more than smash a few cobwebs. You'll see something that'll make you open your eyes. Bobby crawled up on the leaf, caught hold of the thread by which Maya was hanging, clung to it, then let go of the leaf. The thread broke, and they both fell to the ground. That's only the beginning, said Bobby. But Maya, you're trembling. My dear child, you poor little girl, how pale you are. Now who would be so afraid of death? You must look death calmly in the face as I do. So I'll unwrap you now. Maya could not utter a syllable. Bright tears of joy ran down her cheeks. She was to be free again, fly again in the sunshine wherever she wished. She was to live. But then she saw the spider coming down the blackberry vine. Bobby! she screamed. The spider's coming! Bobby went on unperturbed, merely laughing to himself. He really was an extraordinarily strong insect. She'll think twice before she comes nearer, he said. But there, the vile voice rasped above them. Robbers! Help! I'm being robbed! You fat lump! What are you doing with my prey? Don't excite yourself, madam, said Bobby. I have a right, haven't I? To talk to my friend. If you say another word to displease me, I'll tear your whole web to shreds. Well, why so silent all of a sudden? I am defeated, said the spider. That has nothing to do with the case, observed Bobby. Now you'd better be getting away from here. The spider cast a look at Bobby full of hate and venom. But glancing up at her web, she reconsidered and turned away slowly, furious, scolding and growling under her breath. Fangs and stings were of no avail. They wouldn't even leave a mark on armor such as Bobby wore. With violent denunciations against the injustice in the world, the spider hid herself away inside a withered leaf from which she could spy out and watch over her web. Meanwhile, Bobby finished the unwrapping of Maya. He tore the network and released her legs and wings. The rest she could do herself. She preened herself happily, but she had to go slow because she was still weak from fright. You must forget what you have been through, said Bobby. Then you'll stop trembling. Now, see if you can fly. Try. Maya lifted herself with a little buzz. Her wings worked splendidly, and to her intense joy, she felt that no part of her body had been injured. She flew slowly up to the jasmine flowers, drank avidly of their abundant scented honey juice, and returned to Bobby, who had left the blackberry vines and was sitting in the grass. I thank you with my whole heart and soul, said Maya, deeply moved and happy in her regained freedom. Thanks are in place, observed Bobby, but that's the way I always am, always doing something for other people. Now fly away. I'd advise you to lay your head on your pillow early tonight. Have you far to go? No, said Maya. Only a short way. I live at the edge of the beech woods. Goodbye, Bobby. I'll never forget you. Never, never, as long as I live. Goodbye. End of chapter 7 Wow. Maya nearly got eaten up by a spider. Do you think if she did if she did get eaten by the spider, do you reckon the spider would have swallowed Maya up whole? I don't know. I think spiders are very chewy little creatures. I think that spider would have chewed her up.
Isn't that interesting though? Maya, very brave. Red Riding Hood, very brave. They're all these brave girl, young girls. They get themselves into trouble talking to strangers. Do you think it's a good idea to talk to strangers? I'm not so sure. Coming up to an ad break now. We'll see you on the other side with another story. Welcome back. Now, I want to talk to you about a tiger. But first, did you know a boy tiger? What's a boy tiger called? A boy tiger is called a tiger. A girl tiger is called a tigress. Okay, and this is a story about a tigress. This one's called The Tiger Aunt. And I wonder if it's got a similar kind of story to all the other stories we've been listening to. Let's check it out. And it's a Taiwanese folk tale. Once upon a time, two young sisters lived with their loving parents in a remote part of Taiwan. One day, Mum and Dad had to go on a business trip for a couple of days, and so they instructed their two lovely daughters to watch the house and not to open the door to strangers. Got it, replied the sisters enthusiastically, as they waved goodbye to their parents. Unbeknownst to the children, however, was that just behind some bushes, an ancient tigress spirit was hiding and watching. The spirit, after thousands of years of difficult training, had become an evil tiger witch. And her awful specialty? Eating children! The witch waited until the parents were out of sight before emerging from her hiding place to knock on the sister's door to entice the children to let her in. She brought with her some sugary treats. Who are you? The girls asked the tiger witch. I'm your great aunt, the tiger aunt came the reply, and I've come on the request of your parents to come stay with you while they're away. Also, look what I've brought with me. Candies! Hearing this and seeing the treats, the girls dropped their guard and invited the tiger aunt into the house. The tiger aunt assured the sisters that she'd keep them safe. I'll stay the night with you, she said. That way, you won't be afraid of the dark. Later, in the middle of the night, the elder of the two girls woke up by chance. When she opened her eyes, much to her horror, she saw the tiger aunt devouring her sister in one giant gulp. Boom. The older sister fought hard not to scream. When she had calmed down, she had pretended. She pretended not to notice her sister's dis disappearance and asked to go to the outhouse. Once outside, the older sister quickly climbed up a tree well out of the reach of the tiger aunt. And when the wicked tiger witch finally noticed, she was furious and demanded that the child climb down the tree immediately. You know, the young girl explained, if you prepare some piping hot peanut oil to season me with, I would taste much better. Thinking that this was pretty decent culinary advice, the tiger aunt obliged and began heating up a pot of peanut oil. When this was done, the girl suggested bringing the vat of oil up to the tree with a rope so she could apply the oil herself. The tiger again obliged. But when the girl got the pot, she immediately poured its boiling content on the eager witch 
anticipating a meal just beneath the tree. And thus, even though she had lost her younger sister, the clever girl eliminated the evil tiger spirit who could no longer prey upon innocent children in Taiwan. Wow. What a hero. What a brave young girl. All these stories have brave people in them. And almost every single one was a brave young girl. And every single one, I think they talk to strangers. <laughs> oh dear. We have time to play a little song. Let's have a let's have a listen to Frog Pond by Nancy Stewart. Let's go down to the frog pond. Let's go down to the frog pond. Let's go down to the frog pond and listen to the froggies sing. Ribbit, 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 ribbit. Let's go over to the barnyard. Let's go over to the barnyard. Let's go over to the barnyard and listen to the piggies sing. Let's go down to the seashore. Let's go down to the seashore and listen to the fishies sing. Let's go out into the forest. Let's go out into the forest. Let's go out into the forest and listen to the birds. one is the bluefish and blue has a very big voice glug 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 there are so many fish 
fishes in the deep blue sea? What color is the smallest fish you see? Well, the smallest fish is the red fish, and red has a little tiny voice. Cluck, 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 cluck. There are so many fishes in the deep blue sea. What color is the longest fish you see? Well, the longest fish is the green fish, and green has a very long voice. Cluck, 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 cluck. There are so many fishes in the deep blue sea. What color fishies do you see? Well, there's a yellow fish. And a purple fish, and they go glug 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 glug. We have time for one more story. In this one, it's the three little pigs. Let's listen to this one. We've just got time for it. And this one's from StoryNori.com. It's read by Natasha from StoryNori.com. Lots of cool stories on that website, so I recommend to the parents to check that one out. Let's give it a go. Three little pigs. Here we go. Hello, this is Natasha, and I'm dropping by with an extremely famous and exciting story called "The Three Little Pigs." It's about two very silly little pigs. And one rather clever one. There was once a family of pigs. The mother pig was very poor, and so she sent her three little pigs out to seek their fortunes. The first that went off met a man with a bundle of straw, and he said to him, "Please, man, give me that straw to build me a house." Which the man did, and the little pig. Built a house with it. Presently came a wolf, and he knocked at the door and said, "Little pig, little pig, let me come in." To which the pig answered, "No, no, no, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin." The wolf then answered to that, "Then I'll huff and I'll puff." And I'll blow your house in. So he huffed and he puffed and he blew his house in, and ate up the little pig. The second little pig met a man with a bundle of sticks, and he said, "Please, man, give me those sticks to build a house." Which the man did, and the pig built his house. Then along came the wolf and said, "Little pig, little pig, let me come in." No, no, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. So he huffed and he puffed and he huffed and at last he blew the house down and he ate up the little pig. The third little pig met a man with a load of bricks and said, "Please, man, give me those bricks to build a house with." So the man gave him the bricks, and he built his house with them. And so the wolf came, and as he did to the other little pigs, he said, "Little pig, little pig, let me come in." No, no, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. Well, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. 
and he huffed, and he puffed, and he huffed, and he puffed, and he puffed, and he huffed, and he could not get the house down. When he found that he could not, with all his huffing and puffing, blow the house down, he said, Little pig, I know where there is a nice field of turnips. Where? said the little pig. Oh, in Mr Smith's home field. And if you will be ready tomorrow morning, I will call for you. And we will go together and get some dinner. Very well, said the little pig. I will be ready. What time do you mean to go? Oh, at six o'clock. Well, the little pig got up at five and he got the turnips before the wolf came who said little pig are you ready the little pig said ready i have been and come back again and got a nice potful for dinner the wolf felt very angry at this but thought that he would get one up on the little pig somehow or other. So he said, Little pig, I know where there is a nice apple tree. Where? said the little pig. Down at Merry Garden, replied the wolf. And if you will not trick me, I will come for you at five o'clock tomorrow and get some apples. Well, the little pig ran up the next morning at four o'clock and went off for the apples, hoping to get back before the wolf came. But he had farther to go and had to climb up the tree so that just as he was coming down from it, he saw the wolf, which, as you can imagine, frightened him very much. When the wolf came up, he said, Little pig, what? Are you here before me? Are they nice apples? Yes, very, said the little pig. I will throw you down one. And he threw it so far that while the wolf was gone to pick it up, the little pig jumped down and ran home. The next day, the wolf came again and said to the little pig, Little pig, there is a fair at Shanklin this afternoon. Will you go? Oh, yes, said the little pig. I will go. What time shall you be ready? At three, said the wolf. So the little pig went off before the time as usual and got to the fair and bought a butter churn, which he was going home with when he saw the wolf coming. Then he could not tell what to do. So he got into the churn to hide. And by doing so, it turned round and it rolled down the hill with the pig in it, which frightened the wolf so much that he ran home without going to the fair. He went to the little pig's house and told him how frightened he had been by a great round thing which had come down the hill past him. And the little pig said, Ha! I frighten you. I had been up to the fair and bought a butter churn. And when I saw you, I got into it and rolled down that hill. Then the wolf was very angry indeed and said he would eat up the little pig and that he would get down the chimney after him. 
when the little pig saw what he was about. He hung up a pot full of water and made a blazing fire. And just as the wolf was coming down, he took off the cover and in fell the wolf. So the little pig put on the cover again and in an instant boiled him up and ate him for supper and lived happily ever after. And that was the story of the three little pigs. Wow. Do you think the wolf... <laughs> Do you think the wolf just likes going into pots of water? Is it the same wolf in every story? <laughs> What's that all about? But we're coming up to the end of the show. So let's do a nice little breathing exercise. All right. Now breathing exercise time. Okay. Let's do some bird breath. So let's sit down or stand up if you like. And we're going to use our breath to fly. We're going to breathe in to lift our arms up. And we're going to breathe out to lift our arms down. Okay, are you ready? Let's breathe in. And lift our arms up. And breathe out. <sighs> Flap those arms down. Those are our wings. Now let's breathe in. The arms going up. And breathe out. Arms going down. And breathe in. Arms going up. Breathe out and the arms going down and we're flying now. And breathe in. Arms flapping up. Breathe out. Arms going down. And breathe in. Arms going up. Breathe out. Arms going down. Let's try a different one. Let's do some slurping breath. Now, can you stick your tongue out and make a straw shape as if you need your tongue to be a straw to drink some water? Can you roll your tongue around into a circle? Let's stick your tongue out and make a straw. Like this. <laughs> Can you do that? Roll your tongue, sticking out, and let's sip the air through our straw tongue. Let's go. And breathe out. And breathe in. Breathe out. Wow, that's refreshing. Do you notice how the air feels cold? That's a good way to cool yourself down on a hot day. Can you sip the air? Can you put your tongue behind your top teeth? And sip. The air feels really cold and fresh like that too. You sip the air. Now, can you do some snake breath? Can you breathe in like a snake? And breathe out like a snake. All right. And that's all we've got time for. Thanks so much for tuning in to The Secret Kindergarten. And I'll be here for you next week as always. I hope you don't think I'm a stranger. You watch out for strangers out there, all you young children. And be brave as well. We'll see you at the next one.